Good morning. Uh, a few uh, procedural points before we start. We got an eloquent statement from someone in writing as to why it would be better all around if I repeated the essence of the question before I answered it instead of people trying to yell. Uh, and I'm convinced, so I will. Um, also, uh, Professor Beekner says that he wants the class to go on the honor system in terms of how many questions each person has asked and not to waste time grilling each person how many questions have you asked before I answer. So I'm just going to answer hands at random. And he tells me that the immediate neighbors of the person who was asking too many <laughs> questions will squelch him. But if you don't. Also, I want to encourage faculty members. I was asked this by a couple to ask if there's anything you don't know, because uh, I think that your questions or comments would be of general interest to everybody. It would certainly not take away, but would add to the uh, quality of the discussion. But unfortunately, faculty are sitting at the back, probably. And I can't see which are faculty or anybody passed in the last rows. So if you can somehow identify yourself, uh, that would be good, just so I can see which one you are. Also, finally, I have an apology to the photon section of the. Uh, <laughs> because I couldn't see, I uh, can't see at that distance with the lights, I thought there was only one hand in that area of the room regularly waving. I just took for granted it was the same person wanting to pursue the discussion. I was told by many people afterwards that it was six entirely different people <laughs> asking different questions, nothing to do with photons. So maybe I had that on the brain. Uh, so forgive me, I'll try not to discriminate against that section of the room. <laughs> now we have covered uh, metaphysics. I had some good questions at the end. The best questions are always asked in private after the thing is over, and I've asked people to ask them in class so that everyone can get the benefit of them. I think I'll take one only of those before we turn. And that was Andy Bernstein. Is he around? Yeah, OK. My question was, the point of consciousness is basically a metaphysical theory. Subjectivism is basically a physical theory. Is there a causal um, relationship between the two? Um, and if so, what is it? That's a good question. Um, how do I relate the primacy of consciousness and subjectivism? Is one metaphysics, is one epistemology, and is there a causal relation between them? In part, I have to look forward to chapter four to, to answer that. But I would answer this way. The primacy of consciousness is definitely metaphysics. That's why it's included in the chapter on reality, just as the primacy of existence is metaphysics. That is, it tells you what is the, the primacy of existence tells you what is the relationship between existence and consciousness, between the two ingredients that make up reality, ingredients uh, for short. The primacy of existence says existence is there. Consciousness is just the faculty of perceiving it. The primacy of consciousness inverts the order. But both of them are like an inventory of reality and the relationship between its fundamental ingredients. In that sense, they both come under metaphysics. Now, subjectivism, although the term is used in, popularly, can be taken to mean just a form of the primacy of consciousness. If the subject controls the object. In fact, subjectivism as is used seriously as an epistemological term. And in that sense, it's in the same position exactly as intrinsicism. Subjectivism, objectivism with the small o, and, and intrinsicism. Those three are all epistemology. Their essence is to tell us what is the method by which consciousness works in the acquisition of knowledge. What they really tell us, in essence, is how are concepts formed, and therefore, what is knowledge? Now, of course, they are intimately connected to metaphysics, as any epistemology is to metaphysics, and vice versa. Any metaphysics implies an epistemology. But if we're not just to have useless duplication of terms, we should use that trichotomy, subjectivism, objectivism, and intrinsicism for epistemological uses. Primarily how concepts are formed, the three different approaches, and what knowledge is. That's discussed in chapter four. Primacy of consciousness and existence is metaphysics. Now, what is the connection? The connection is simply this. The primacy of existence 
is logically connected to the objective theory of concept formation. If you hold the primacy of existence and carry it out fully, you will be led to the objective theory of concept formation. On the other hand, if you accept the objective theory of concept formation, you will necessarily have to accept the primacy of existence. So either entails the other. It's not cause and effect in that one comes first, although reality precedes our concepts. But it's that those two ideas, those two principles, are logically interconnected. You couldn't have one without the other. By the same token, the primacy of consciousness logically necessitates either subjectivism or intrinsicism, not necessarily subjective. Because the primacy of consciousness, if you recall, comes in variants, in varieties. And uh, one variety of the primacy of consciousness, the supernatural kind, is logically paired with which of the epistemological terms we're talking about? Intrinsicism. Intrinsicism is, in essence, the idea that you are given revelations, well, from somewhere, from some superior form of consciousness is what it comes down to. And in that sense, if you take the in intrinsicist approach, you are going to be led to the supernatural primacy of consciousness. And by the same token, if you take the supernatural primacy of consciousness, then you're saying there's some consciousness that's controlling reality. It will be then your source of information, and that will lead you to intrinsicism. And it works the same way on the social or, or human side. That is, if you take the social primacy of consciousness, you will be led to subjectivism, and vice versa. If you take any form of subjectivism, well, then, depending on whether it's personal or social, you will be led to the corresponding version of the primacy of consciousness. So these are definitely, absolutely logically uh, related. We'll, we'll cover that further when we get to subjectivism and um, intrinsicism. But uh, I'm glad you asked that now, just to make the point that don't confuse the term subjectivism with primacy of consciousness. Otherwise, you make the term useless. Although, as I say, the term is often used to mean just some form of primacy of consciousness. To make it a serious, significant, independent term, it's got to be a specific theory of concept formation and knowledge, which I define in chapter four. So thank you for that question, Andy. All right, now I want to turn to, well, I, I do want to get to this chapter. Is this? OK, one last question, his famous last words. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I do have something to say on this answer. 49, OK. Well, physics with science is equally ground. Yes. I guess I would have thought that. You think that physics and science are synonymous? Yeah. No, absolutely they are not. Physics is. Now, this is the, going to be my last, last question before I start. Physics is one special science. It's a very broad special science because it takes the whole world of matter and energy as its subject. But only if you are a materialist would physics be coextensive with science. Because then you would have to say, no matter what you studied, it's to be studied under the study of matter and energy. But that isn't true. There is at least two other subjects which are not uh, part of physics. And that is psychology, which studies the mind, consciousness, mental processes. And leaving aside the question that was posed yesterday, whether you know, in the fullness of time we can reduce uh, consciousness to matter, that doesn't alter the fact that there's an entire field of phenomena to be studied which cannot be studied by the methods of physics. They have to be studied b based on introspective data. And the same is true of biological phenomena. There's an entire field of biology which cannot yet be reduced to physics. And then, of course, there are many subdivisions within physics. Then there are all the social sciences. Now, notice I stress the word science. A social science is a science, at least in theory, not the way it's practiced uh, most of the time today, but it is a science. Uh, and you don't study economics by the method of physics uh, uh, or uh, history or whatever, political science. Even in a broad sense, you can talk about the science of philosophy, even though you know, we commonly contrast science and philosophy. But in, uh, the proper definition of science is given here where? Um, 
on this very page, I think. The next sentence. Science is systematic knowledge gained by the use of reason based on observation. It has to be systematic knowledge because <clears throat> all knowledge is gained by reason based on observation. But it's when it's systematized according to principles. You carve out an area. You lay down certain foundations, and then you organize your knowledge. That is a science. That's all it is. And there's nothing in that, if you're not a materialist, that says it has to be physics. Neither that it has to be study physical matter as such, nor that it has to follow the experimental methods of physics. OK, now, that would have been a perfect question under the polemics discussion yesterday. All right, now I want to turn to epistemology in our last few minutes. Uh, I think of epistemology <clears throat> as a giant castle. This is an analogy. And the ground floor is a huge, uh, what would you call it, like a ballroom or a great hall, which is the foundation and all the upper stories, you have to go through this grand hall. And they are built on it. And of course, that grand hall is the stand-in for what subject? Concept formation. The nature of concepts. That is the substance, the foundation of the whole subject. And then above that is built all the consequences for how you should acquire knowledge, what's the status of our knowledge, all the things that I talk about in chapters 4 and 5. But before you get to the Great Hall, you have to go through a little passageway, like a purgatory, to prepare you for entry into it. And I think of that as the anteroom of epistemology. And that is the subject of chapter 2, which at one point I was thinking of calling the anteroom, but that gives a little too much dignity to a metaphor. The anteroom is not really epistemology proper in the sense that it does not give you any information as to how to think. If epistemology in substance is a practical subject, it tells you how to use your mind, how to uh, use your consciousness so as to acquire knowledge proper. Well, the things we're saying in chapter 2 do not give you that kind of advice. What they do do is pave the way for it. They tell us the things we have to know as a minimum about our consciousness before we can study the substance, namely concept formation, and how to do it properly. So it's like a preliminary. And I went through the totality of philosophy, because in my lectures, uh, you know, things were all, the ones I gave in 76 were all scattered around. And I determined that there were only two real issues that belong in this preliminary status. And that is sense perception and volition. And I try to explain in the beginning of the chapter why each of these. Uh, <clears throat> why sense perception? Concepts, of course, are nothing but integrations of sensory data. If we are to validate our knowledge, the first question is, are the senses valid? Do they bring us into contact with reality? If the answer to that is no, the whole thing is aborted. We just can close up shop right there. So the first question is, what is the function of the senses? What are they supposed to give us? Is it reliable as a foundation? That, I think, is obvious. I can't give you advice on how to use your senses because it's an automatic function. But what philosophers have to do is validate that function. And then the other one, why should free will precede epistemology? And my answer is that free will precedes the totality of the rest of philosophy. All of philosophy, in essence, is normative. That is, that's the only reason we need this subject, to tell us how to live. Philosophy is a guide to life. That's Phi Beta Kappa, philosophy the guide to life. And guide means something which gives you guidance, which gives you advice, which tells you how you should do something. In that sense, it's not only the specifically value subjects like ethics that is normative, but in this broad sense, epistemology is normative. It tells you how you should use your mind, how you should think, 
how you should come to conclusions if they're to be reliable. And then ethics tells you how you should act, politics, how you should organize society, aesthetics, how you should create and respond to art. So in that sense, the whole of philosophy is really guidelines to various aspects of living. And therefore, the precondition of all of it is volition. If we didn't have volition, the whole question of how we should behave would not come up. You can't uh, uh, be told what you should do if you haven't got the power to control what you do if you have no choice. In that sense, I think volition is a precondition of all of philosophy. Uh, if we had no volition, we could get away with metaphysics if somehow we had a conceptual faculty. Because metaphysics does not give advice. All metaphysics does is say, look, it's there. That's it. That's the summation of the first 50-odd uh, pages of the book. It is. I point out there's reality, existence. Existence exists, but that's really all we've had to say. And if we didn't have volition, we would be given that automatically, so even metaphysics wouldn't be necessary. But once you have that basic foundation, something is, the next question is, so what? What should I do about it? That, th that there is something. And before you can say that, you've got to know you've got this faculty to direct what you're doing. Therefore, I think free will is the foundation of all of philosophy. So I would summarize the substance of the anteroom in two principles. We first have to establish that what's given automatically is reliable. And of course, if we weren't given anything automatically, we couldn't function. If you had to spin the entire content out of your mind by some act of choice, with no automatic data fed to you, then you would have no means whatever of coming in contact with reality. So if there's knowledge, something has to be given automatically. And the first principle to establish then is what we're given automatically is reliable. But then the second principle has to be the automatic is not the total. Something is built on it. Uh, and what's built on it is non-automatic. When we've established those two, we're then set up to say, OK, how do we use our faculty of choice on the data given automatically in order to form our volitional human means of knowledge? And that takes us into concept formation. Now, you see the hierarchical structure here, why it's not just a matter of convenience. It's a matter of logic that after existence, after reality, you have to go right to these two principles in the anterior. These two topics, sense perception and uh, volition. Now let's say a few words on the an overview on the uh, senses. The first sequence lays out the general validity of the senses. And notice that it's called the senses as necessarily valid. I try to avoid the word necessarily, except when it's necessary. Uh, but here it is, because I want to say not simply the senses are valid, our senses are valid, but any and everybody's senses in any and every possible situation have to be valid. There is no such thing as an invalid sense perception. And that's, I realize that's a lot to pack into the word necessarily, but that's the underlying consideration why I wanted to put that in. The reasons are given, I think, clearly in the sequence, and they're not too uh, uh, revolutionary if you know objectivism. Uh, to establish that, you basically identify the axiomatic character of the senses. You point out their proper function. They tell us that something is not what. You distinguish the sensory from the conceptual function. And uh, you, above all, have to stress and explain the point that they tell us that something exists somehow. That's the issue of sensory form. We perceive in a certain form dependent upon the kind of sensory apparatus we have. You cannot minimize the form. You cannot ignore the form. You cannot pretend that you get reality stripped of any means of getting it. But given that you must give all possible weight to the fact that we have a form, a form is still a form of perceiving reality. And it does not negate or invalidate our perception. That's the basic synopsis of the issue of the senses as valid. Of course, I elaborated in the sequence. I want to give you just an overview before we start on specific questions. Now, that, of course, right away raises the question. That is, the issue of form raises the question. 
But if that's the most tortuous issue in connection with sense perception, that people either get or they don't get. And if they don't get, it's hard to pound it into their head. People say right away, not only people, but philosophers, uh, <laughs> if you have to perceive in a certain form, for instance, if red or green is our form of perceiving certain objects in reality, doesn't it follow that we don't really see the object? When we see red, the red isn't out there in the object, they say. It's just in here, in the mind. After all, you yourself just said red is something contributed by the uh, human senses. And if that's the case, doesn't it end up that we are trapped you know, in our minds, like the British empiricists that this gentleman over here called out to our attention yesterday, and we never can really get to reality? Now, it's to clarify all the issues involved in this that the second sequence of this chapter was written, sensory qualities as real. Uh, because we have to, the, 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 the decisive issue to sol salvage the senses, to validate them, is to refute this idea that because it's a function, of something is a function of our means of perception, therefore it is not, quote, in the object. If you can break that idea in your mind, uh, then you will be able to perceive with equanimity for the rest of your life. And the substance of the a uh, answer is given from 65 to 67, if you want to turn there for a second. Remember, we were hypothesizing that uh, by the way, let me say, I'm taking for granted that you have read this chapter before we discuss it. I realize that some people haven't from the questions that are being asked, which were explicitly answered in the chapter. But at least you can't blame me if you haven't, because I'm not reiterating what I think should be already clear. But we were hypothesizing in uh, this section that reality consisted of puffs of energy, some, something completely inconceivable to us at this moment. And that when those energy puffs acted on us, on our senses, the result was the physical world as we see it. That is, we're making the most extravagant claim in favor of the skeptics. The world in, in itself, quote, is completely unlike uh, the way it looks to us. And I say, even granted that, and I remember clearly the day in Ayn Rand's apartment when she, I put that question to her, and she led me down uh, this very indignantly down the passage that I'm giving you from 65 to 67. She said, well, suppose it is that. Are you part of reality? And I said, yes. She said, then you're made of the pups, too. I said, yeah, I guess so. She said, did you create yourself out of the pups? No. Is it, are they a function of your consciousness? No. I can't. This is not her exact wording, but this is the idea. Well, I can't quite communicate the degree of indignation. Um, <laughs> she said, well, then in sense perception, what happens? I said, well, I the pups out there interact with the puffs which are me. And she said, do you control the effect? I know I have nothing to do with the effect. Uh, so in other words, her point was, the elements in reality, including you, interact independent of your will or consciousness entirely. And the inevitable result of that is a red, green, hot, cold, et cetera world. Now, you're telling me something is inherent in and absolutely unavoidable given the fundamental nature of reality. It's a metaphysical given, expressive of the very essence of reality without any will or consciousness being involved. Now, how can you say, therefore, it's unreal? And uh, of course, I was uh, completely uh, flabbergasted. And she made there all these points that I'm making here, that you don't subvert the reality of something by explaining it. You don't make something subjective by identifying the causes that underlie it. You don't wipe something out by explaining it. She was even more eloquent, but that's the most I can uh, remember of uh, I tried to recapture her. That was a revelation to me, because it were all the naive realists in history struggle to say, oh, the red really is out there uh, in the object. We don't, our senses contribute nothing, whatever. And they're always on the defensive uh, about the senses, uh, she took the bull by the horns and said, it's irrelevant 
whether the red is produced by our senses or is an attribute of atoms. She said the fact is whichever, something in reality caused it, including you as part of reality. And you can't ask any more of the senses than that they give you reality somehow. And uh, it's one of those things like, uh, who created the universe? You have to get to the point of saying, I won't ask that. Who created it? It wasn't created. It is. Existence exists. And the same thing with the senses. You can't keep saying, but I want to see the world know-how. I'd like to strip, a, a pull away my eyes and get to see the way things, quote, really are. As long as you have that, that is the equivalent in epistemology of trying to find a god that produced existence. You have to perceive somehow there is no other meaning to the word perceive. Perceive is used your consciousness, including its organ. And if you accept that, uh, you have no problem. If you don't, nobody can do anything for you. And it's like a mental reorientation. One day you simply have to make a resolution. OK, I'll accept it if that's the way reality is. And then you have no problem. Now, I want to point out that while it's true, it makes no difference where red is. Uh, and there is a sense in which you can say, no, it's not in the object. It's a result of an interaction. Uh, it's a false dichotomy to talk about in the object versus in the mind. Because in a deeper sense, everything is in the object. Everything is in the object. And this is expressed on page 67. I'd like to just call your attention starting about five lines down there on 67. Consciousness is only a faculty of awareness. It doesn't create its content or even the sensory form in which it's aware of that content. That's a result of an interaction. The, and here's the key sentence, I think, that summarizes it very clearly. The source of a sensory form, that is red, green, et cetera, is not consciousness but existential fact independent of consciousness. In other words, the source is the metaphysical nature of reality itself. Now, I don't think you can beat that as a formulation. And that means reality itself is the source of everything we perceive. And in that sense, everything we perceive is part of reality. If you can accept that, you can perfectly legitimately say everything is out there. Red is out there, even if red is our form of perceiving what's out there, because our form itself is a result of the, inter of the interaction of objects with our senses, which are also physical objects existing in reality and following its laws. You got that? So I mean, this is either easy or unintelligible. I don't think there's a middle ground here. Now, that leads us directly to the crucial point of the chapter. And that is the next sequence. Consciousness as possessing identity. Now, this is Ayn Rand's true genius, this principle. And perhaps I, and I know you know this principle, so I'm not going to lecture on it now. And I've covered it in the chapter anyway. But maybe it'll be helpful for you to look at it this way. We can distinguish metaphysics and epistemology from this point of view. Both subjects are absolutely dominated by the law of identity. Metaphysics focuses on the relationship between existence and identity. Epistemology on the relationship between consciousness and identity. So if we have the three axioms, existence, consciousness, and identity. The first thing is to establish existence and all of its corollaries. And its corollaries are all different aspects of A as A. That includes causality, primacy of existence, and so on. Epistemology treats consciousness and how we acquire knowledge and its foundation, its, what, its groundwork is consciousness has identity. Therefore, really what we're doing, you could say with the, in epistemology, is it, deriving all of the consequences of consciousness being something in the same way that in metaphysics we derived all the consequences of existence being something. And therefore, we always have to have as our, as our axiom in discussing epistemology, 
We are dealing with a consciousness of a certain kind that has to function by certain means. All standards of knowledge, all concepts describing knowledge, whether it's valid, whether the term we're using is, quote, valid, certain, absolute, uh, you name it. Whatever the term, if it's uh, to be applied to a human consciousness, we have to start with the human consciousness. Now, if you keep that in mind, you can't go wrong. Now, I'd like you to notice at the outset that this is a really a very big revolution in epistemology on Ayn Rand's part. Because the principle underlying all of epistemology up to her has been that knowledge is possible only if consciousness has no identity. Only if consciousness is a void and nothing, devoid of character. The earliest, I'm not going to give you a whole history of philosophy, but a mini. The earliest here were the sophists in ancient Greece. And they applied it only to the sensory level. You know the standard sophist argument. When you, two men put their hands in lukewarm water, and one guy's hand is cold, so he says, how warm? And the other guy's hand is hot, so he says, how cool? And they shrug and say, you see, the nature of their senses influences the way they perceive. Therefore, no one perceives reality, etc. Therefore, they say, <coughs> we have to perceive by our senses. Therefore, we have to perceive somehow. Therefore, no good. It's not the way things really are. Now, at that point, Plato and the rationalists came in. And they said, OK, the senses are no good. But thankfully, we have a faculty that's independent of the senses, namely reason, which operates by uh, uh, innate ideas. And therefore, reason can give us knowledge of reality, even if we can't rely on the senses. And that gave you a millennia or more of rationalism. But at least they tried to retain the idea we can live in reality. We can know reality. There are absolute. There is truth. Uh, because they had the faculty of reason to hold on to. Now, what finally ended this, the decisive historical turning point, was Kant. And all he really did is say he had one clever idea. He was the first ever to take the thought what the sophist said about the senses is just as applicable to reason or the mind, which was absolutely true, absolutely unanswerable, and utterly devastating. Kant said, in effect, now he took you know, thousands of unintelligible pages to say it, but reduced to its essence from our point of view, he said, look, in the exact same way that what we perceive depends on our senses, what we think depends on our mind. If we had a different kind of mind, if it functioned differently, if it didn't, for instance, use concepts, or it didn't form them the way it did, or whatever, we, all of our knowledge would be radically altered. All of our conceptual, intellectual, rational knowledge. And this is sometimes called the logicocentric predicament. You know what that is? The predicament is we can't use any logic but human logic. And whenever we try to say something is logical, it's because it's logical to our human minds. But if we wanted to know whether it's really logical, we'd have to see whether it was logical in itself apart from our minds. But how can we do that? We can't get out of our minds. We're trapped. Therefore, the best proof is no proof. The best argument is just for us. We can't get out of our minds exactly in the same method that the sophist said we can't get out of the senses. And when Kant did that, that was the end of rationalism. Therefore, there was nothing left. He finally drew the principle that if consciousness is something, it's invalid. It can't know reality. And he drew the conclusion, therefore, down with reality. Now, he didn't say it. He said it was still there, but we couldn't know it. So. But that's a different question. But what it amounted to was he got rid of reality once and for all by simply applying to the concepts what the sophists had done to the senses. And it was self-evident once he said it that it had to be true. Now, ever since uh, Kant, of course, the goal of philosophy has been how to function without reference to reality. And Hegel said the only way would be to make one up ourselves. 
That's idealism. Subjectivism and so on. Dewey said, let's not bother about it and just concern ourselves with what works, however we would know that. So it's been disaster ever since, but you see the whole thing hinged, the entire history hinged on this principle of consciousness possessing identity being an obstacle to cognition. If I had to single out any one principle, that is what has destroyed the whole of epistemology and with it the whole of philosophy. Now, unfortunately, on this particular point, Aristotle offers no answer at all. On many points, he does. But on this one, he doesn't. Because he too held, at least judging from the fragments we have, that if the mind is something, that would interfere with its objectivity. And so he stresses that the mind is nothing. As in his terminology, it's nothing actual. It's merely the potential of becoming its object. The best he could struggle to do to make sense of validity was to say, when you perceive something in his terminology, when you perceive a certain form, that form becomes actualized in your mind. So the identical redness is out there and in your eyeball. Uh, the identical abstraction is out there in the object, in tableless, and in here in your mind as tablehood. Uh, and he called the mind the place of form. It's a bare place. It's nothing. And he felt. If you gave it some character, any character, then you could, would have to be reduced to conscious. He didn't use that word con, of course, but that was the idea. Now, of course, this is hopeless. Everybody jumped down his throat to say, how can a, a nothing, a nothing actual, perceive, think, etc.? It can't be done. So the mind has to be something. And the problem was, of course, that I'm sure that if Aristotle had the concept of consciousness, since he also had the concept of identity, he wouldn't have had a problem. But as I pointed out yesterday, the Greeks did not have that concept. Unfortunately, by the time the concept was formed with Augustine, philosophy had already turned mystical. So they had given away the senses, the body. They had turned against everything that would give consciousness a nature. And consequently, they couldn't do anything with the concept. They had thrown out the law of identity. The first time in the history of thought that we have the concept of consciousness united with a, a militant, formal, explicit acceptance of the law of identity is with Einrein. And that is her crucial role in the history of epistemology. That is what is the importance of consciousness as uh, possessing identity. And that's why I expect her theory in time, I don't know whether in our lifetime, to revolutionize the history of the uh, subject. Because this is really a, a climactic turning point. Now, of course, she couldn't have done it without her theory of concepts and every, uh, all the other things that led her to grasp this principle. But nevertheless, this principle in itself has the status that, on the one hand, it's self-evident. Of course, consciousness is something. No, who could deny it? And yet, on the other hand, who could deny it? Everybody in history has denied it, has emphatically denied it. And if you see that, you see that here is a case where the self-evident is unknown, un unconceived by the totality of professionals in the field. Now, um, I want to say one more word about the placement of this principle, consciousness as possessing identity. As I told you, I labored long and hard over the order of these because I wanted to do it in logical order, remembering that we're not rational. If this principle of consciousness as possessing identity is so crucial, and it's the fundamental axiom of epistemology, and so on, and so on, and so on, why wouldn't you start the chapter with this uh, principle? Why wouldn't this be the first sequence right under, you know, um, uh, sense, perception, and volition. Number one, we're at the beginning here now, consciousness possessing identity. Lay that down and then just read off in the next section. Well, of course, the senses must be valid. That's our identity. That's our form of perceiving reality. Now, I, you see that there's a question there? I will make a confession to you. For several years, that's how I wrote it. I wrote it with this sequence first, and then the part on the senses as necessarily valid as a deduction 
derivation from it. Since consciousness has identity, it has to proceed by certain means. Therefore, you can't hold those means against it. Therefore, you know, don't use them to invalidate the sense. And uh, I had to get pretty far into it to realize that there's a basic mistake, a basic logical mistake in that sequence, in that order. And it makes, only makes logical sense in this order. Now, who can see what would be wrong I'm not doing this just to expose my own errors, but so you'll get a sense of the hierarchical structure, the, because there's some very important points logically as, to this. Yes? The sense perception is axiomatic. The validity of the sense is axiomatic, so you shouldn't be deriving it from uh, Absolutely. You hit that. I wish uh, I had asked you this several years ago. <laughs> he says sense perception is axiomatic, so you should not be deriving it from anything. And I, I say amen to that. You cannot derive the sense validity of the senses from anything, anything, even from the axioms of philosophy. Why not? Where do the axioms come from? Remember, I said axioms are perceptual self-evidences. And therefore, they come from what we're told by our eyes and ears. You cannot get underneath the sense data. And if you have anything like this, uh, existence has primacy over consciousness. Consciousness has identity. A is A, and so on. Therefore, the senses are valid. Finished. You're wiped out. You have destroyed the logic. You've invalidated your axioms. You've lost the axiomatic character of the senses. You've subverted the whole thing. There is nothing whatever you can say about proving the validity of the senses. And you do not deduce it from the principle that consciousness has identity. On the contrary, now let's go to the next one. So that's excellently observed on your part. Uh, what would it mean, hierarchically, to say consciousness has identity before we study sensory perception? What would be the content of consciousness has identity as a statement? Would you uh, go to bed, wake up one morning, and say, gee, I got an axiom of consciousness and an axiom of uh, identity, so I'll just stick the two together and say consciousness has identity. That wouldn't mean anything. You wouldn't have any clue what consciousness it was. What was its identity? It would be what? A floating abstraction. The only way you could reach such an idea as consciousness has identity, if it's to be other than just a rationalistic floating abstraction, you know, just to quote deduction from A as A, then everything is something. But if you're to give actual meat, actual content to consciousness has identity, what do you have to do? You have to observe its operation inductively. You have to observe it functioning and see what it does. It uses certain organs, it has experiences, it puts them together a certain way, it has sensations and then percepts and then concepts and so on. At least on some level, you have to grasp what are its means and forms of perception. And then you have meaning to the idea, I see, it has to function somehow. And then it simply becomes like, a, like an inductive summation. Consciousness possesses identity. You say, oh yes, I'm just stating in the broadest, most abstract terms what I've already concretized, what I've already seen the instances of in my direct experience. So here again, this, the issue is relating our broad abstractions back to the direct data of experience. And the direct data of experience that underlies consciousness possesses identity is my consciousness and yours acquires its knowledge by doing certain things, using certain organs. And first, we immerse ourselves in that. And that's why it has to be an inductive summation after the senses. Even though it's an axiom, it can't be stated at the outset. Do you get that? that? If you get this, that will be, I think, helpful in pounding any rationalism out of you, those of you who are philosophy majors, because I know you become desperate to lay down you know, this self-evident and make marshal the proof so that no one can touch you. Uh, you just can't do it. You always have to go back to the observational data. Now, one other point here, and then I'll stop this long overview uh, of the um, chapter. I want to make one further connection or integration for you. 
The topic of the mind-body relation is central to objectivism. It runs throughout the philosophy and is one that you should keep track of throughout. In uh, the first chapter, we discussed it from a metaphysical point of view. That is how it's a corollary of the acceptance of the, the metaphysically given. Uh, now I want you to simply uh, quickly see how the Ayn Rand's position on the mind-body dichotomy relates to the issue of consciousness having identity. Who can make the connection between? Consciousness has identity, and therefore there's no mind-body dichotomy. Or therefore mind and body are harmonious, integrated. Because that'll give you another strand feeding into Ayn Rand's insistence that mind and body are a unit. You understand what I'm asking? Last time we looked at that from the point of view of existence and consciousness. Now we want to look at it from the point of view of consciousness and identity. How does the fact that consciousness has identity underlie Ayn Rand's view that mind and body are harmonious, that there's no war between them? Because it does. I want you to keep track, put in your notebook, mind-body is a central issue running throughout the objectivist philosophy. And uh, you want to connect everything one way or the other through that, because you'll miss uh, a key element. That includes your know, theory and practice, and sex and love, and moral and the practical, and concepts and percepts. It, it runs throughout the whole philosophy. Uh, so uh, we want to get its, its roots right at the beginning. Now, you forgot my question, right? How do you relate the axiom that consciousness has identity to the issue of the mind-body dichotomy? John. Because it has identity, it is something. And therefore, it's part of the body, it's part of the... Well, you say because it has identity, it's something. It's a little more specific than that. Consciousness is conceived from the outset as a faculty with material means for gaining awareness. Before we even get to consciousness as identity, we observe consciousness. And how did we grasp consciousness to begin with? Do you remember how? I, I indicated in the last chapter. How do we reach the concept even implicitly? We, we, as children, we close our eyes and the world goes away. We open them and the world comes back. We grasp the functioning of our senses. That's the most primitive form in which you grasp your faculty of awareness. Which means that from the very outset, you only grasp consciousness by grasping a faculty of sense perception. You grasp that even before you grasp any concepts, before you have any concepts to grasp. So in terms of the grasping of it, and then in terms of any discussion of it, consciousness from our very first glimmer of it is inherently a faculty which gains awareness by certain means, by seeing, hearing, etc. Even if we can't use those words for it, it has its physical instrumentality built into it from our very first concept of it. And therefore, if you, if you realize that that's the nature of the, of the faculty, you couldn't ever dream someday of getting to the point of separating consciousness from its body. Because as soon as you did that, you would say, well, then I'm separating consciousness from sense perception. And if I'm doing that, what do I mean by consciousness? What is awareness? If you went back to the existential roots, it's, I don't, there is no awareness. There's only seeing, hearing, etc. In other words, there can be no possible war between consciousness and matter, because consciousness, by its nature and by our first grasp of it, is the faculty that grasps matter by using matter. And if you hold that in mind, you will be like Ayn Rand when people will talk about the immortal soul. She actually wondered what possessed them. Because what, what were they talking about when they talk about a consciousness that goes on free-floating in another dimension without sensory organs? Uh, it's ev ev eviscerated. The uh, uh, concept becomes simply empty. It means nothing, because it's detached from its actual roots in reality. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, that this feeds into the same principle. Now, I won't say anything here about the last sequence that we're going to look at today, the perceptual as the, uh, uh, as the given. That is uh, primarily to just 
develop things in sequence. There's sensation, perception, and then conception. But the transition from sensation to perception is automatic, so there's nothing we can do about that, and there's no correct or incorrect way to do it. The only real significance of this is to uh, stop anybody who tries to reconstruct knowledge from sensations. And of course, in a way, that's polemical. I'm thinking of people like David Hume, who say that when you try to construct human knowledge, you should start with sensations and infer entities and causality and so on from sensations. And of course, as he found out, you can't do it. And so you end up simply watching helplessly as disconnected sensations go by. But of course, Ayn Rand's view is that that is a fundamental mistake. Sensations come first chronologically. But logically, when we are constructing human knowledge, we are, do not now live in a world of pure sensations. It's a scientific hypothesis that there even is such a stage uh, What we are directly given uh, as adults is the perceptual level, that is the level of entities. All right, that's a pretty uh, lengthy overview. Let us do some questions on uh, the senses as necessarily valid. That's 55 to, where does that stop? To 62 before our break. OK. I don't know whether you would rather that I talk at length like this or rather that I shut up so you can ask questions. But um, I'll give you a choice. Some days I'll have nothing to say so you can be disappointed that way. And some days I'll have too much to say so you can be disappointed. Right. OK. Now on the, let's try to keep to the first sequence, the, the preliminary sequence, simply the laying down that this is thou. Who has questions on that? You want to wave? Is that clear to everybody? Are going once? All right, yes. Where, where else and what other time to ask this question? It's just something that, that you okay. brought up. And it, it, it applies to uh, the branches of philosophy more in general. But in time, the axioms of existence. A little louder. The axiom of existence. In time, the axioms of existence, consciousness, and identity to the branches of philosophy. You said that metaphysics is the identity of existence, and then that epistemology is the identity of consciousness. Yeah. Would it be correct to apply the only remaining relationship between those three axioms, that being the proper relationship between existence and consciousness? No, I've already covered that. To the branch of ethics. The no. proper, he's saying if we take the three axioms out of a hat, is there another subject to care? If, if metaphysics covers existence and identity, and epistemology covers consciousness and identity. What covers existence and consciousness? The last combination. There is no subject to cover that, or rather, every subject covers that. Because the basic relation is stated in metaphysics. That's the primacy of existence. That means existence is in relation to consciousness. On the other hand, all of epistemology is only how to bring your consciousness into the right relation to existence, how to acquire knowledge. And all of ethics is how to guide your action by keeping your consciousness in relation to existence. So I once, in fact, was tempted to define philosophy as the science of keeping consciousness related to existence. All it really is is tell you how to keep those two related. But I, I don't want to do anything in this book that I don't necessarily know that Ayn Rand would have agreed with. The problem with writing a book of this kind and describing the ideas to her is that I have to keep out anything uh, which I didn't discuss with her, because it's simply not fair to put this forth to posterity as her ideas if I, I'm not 100% sure. So I've got a box full of you know, ideas of my own that I left out of this book. Um, and even then, something may have crept in. So I'm going to have a preface to the effect of the way the Christians used to preface when they wrote, anything good comes from God, and any mistakes are my fault. <laughs> And I have to have a preface to that effect, uh, but I didn't put that in about existence and consciousness for that reason. That, but I'm pretty sure she would agree with that. However, let's go on then to the next sequence. That, oh, you found something. Yes. You can't talk about the identity of consciousness without talking about the relationship of consciousness and existence. Correct. Is that it? 
Yes, correct. You can't talk about the identity of consciousness without talking about the relation of consciousness to existence. Absolutely correct. Consciousness is only awareness of something. You can't perceive it. That is, even form the awareness of awareness without first being aware of something. You can't form the concept except in relation to existence. You can't describe anything to consciousness except in relation to existence. Therefore, the identity of consciousness is a certain form and certain means of grasping existence. So uh, in that sense, absolutely. There's no little ball of consciousness, which is something that you could put in your pocket and carry around that doesn't relate to uh, existence. Now, I want to see if I had anything I wanted to point out to you in that uh, first sequence. Um, oh, I wanted to make a slight confession, I see, that uh, there is a fair amount of polemics in connection with the senses, uh, which is the, really the most grievous exception to my rule of polemics. But uh, it was because the real need for an expanded section on the senses is the disasters that have come throughout uh, history. If you lived on a desert island, this is the one sequence that I would say could be heavily condensed. Because on a desert island, it's supposing you wanted to be a philosopher, but you weren't filled with corruption. You'd have to know this much. The senses um, only tell me that something exists. It's up to my mind to tell me what. They are infallible within the limits that they tell me that. They give me the evidence of everything, condensed, and they do it in a certain form, somehow. That's it. You would not have to go into the long song and dance about what if we had different senses, and so on and so on. Uh, and is the qualities really out there? Um, I mean, you would if simply if the thought occurred to you. But it wouldn't be, be uh, necessary because you would simply take the senses as functioning automatically as they function. There's nothing you can do about it. You would see they give you reality, and then you would devote your time to the concepts and so on. Uh, therefore, there is a lot of good, positive information. But for practical guidance, you do not need to know more than that the senses give you the base, it's valid, and if function of, uh, from here on is to grasp the what. Uh, and that they give it to you in some form. Uh, so a lot of this is polemics, but it's because of the unique uh, history of the subject. And uh, I think it's really the only sequence in the whole, the whole uh, foundations that is that. So I may as well acknowledge it. One other thing I wanted to point out in 57. Um, you see the first hint there of something that's going to be essential throughout objectivism, and that is the idea of condensation. The bottom paragraph of 57. You see, this was Ayn Rand's formulation that the function of the senses is to sum up, to condense a vast range of facts. There's this huge, sprawling reality with a trillion facts, more than that. And it's all condensed into a few handful of sensations, red, cool, fragrant, etc. And that contains within it this vast amount of data uh, that we then have to learn to unravel. This is the first use of the idea of uh, we could think of as unit economy or condensation. And it was it always interesting to me that Ayn Rand took the same approach in this way to the senses, although they do it automatically, that she subsequently took to concept formation. The problem is reality is vast, and our consciousness is extremely limited. How do we get the totality within our consciousness? And it was her, I think, really important discovery is that there must be some mechanism of condensation, of unit reduction. Now, in full-fledged form, that is the theory of concept formation. But you can see it foreshadowed even in her view of the senses. And what they do automatically is take the totality of reality and condense it into a few sensations that re reduce it to the number of elements we can deal with. And so I, I always found that helpful. Um, in passing, I want to make one last thing, and then we'll take our break. I do promise you there'll be other days where I say nothing. So it's just more convenient to do it when it's all together. Um, I want to just point out to you 
For those of you who are tempted to rationalism, on 58, you see uh, the middle paragraph about four lines from the bottom. <clears throat> One can, therefore, think about nothing. Now, in case you're not familiar with this, Bertrand Russell and his type, the rationalist type, used to argue like this. If you're thinking, you can't think about nothing. Because thinking about nothing is the same as not thinking. Therefore, you must be thinking about something. Suppose you're thinking about a unicorn. You're thinking about something. But it's not, there's no unicorns in this world. What's the conclusion? There must be a unicorn in another world. That's what you're really thinking about. And so we had a whole second reality of unicorns, Santa Clauses, round squares, all the things that he could think about that worked in this world. And of course, this, in a way, is, is the whole platonic argument. How can we think about perfection when we don't find it? There must be another world where there's perfection, and so on. Now, that is purely linguistic, semantic rationalism. Uh, and I, I want to just indicate to you that you can perfectly well think about nothing if you focus on what you're doing, what that actually denotes. You're spinning your wheels. You're interconnecting concepts, which maybe separately are defined, but you are putting them together in a way that has no referent in reality. There's nothing whatever mysterious about that, nor does it require another dimension about which you're thinking. It would only lead to that conclusion if you just take language without reference to reality. Yes, thinking about nothing. Well, of course, you can't think about nothing. Then you can spin out your construct. Now, this is the type of thing that you have to avoid doing. And I thought I would just pass it by here. You can't perceive nothing. What's the difference between thinking and perceiving? If you perceive, it has to be real. What is the difference in a word? One is automatic. It's given. There's nothing you have any choice about. If you experience it, it's there. Uh, leaving aside the hallucinations that were mentioned yesterday, but those are not perception. They're not a form of extrospection. But if you're perceiving, it's there. It's real. But if you're thinking, that leaves open the question, is it valid or not? All right, let's take our break and come back, starting with uh, sensory qualities as real. Now we're on sensory qualities as real. And I think I've said uh, basically everything that I want to say right now about that. So I'll turn it open to questions on that sequence, sensory qualities as real. Yes? Is necessarily valid? Can I ask one more? Sure. Okay. There are dozens or hundreds of arguments, you know, why the senses are invalid. And some of them, they stump me. I don't know. I wouldn't know how to answer them. And whenever that happens, I just say, well, how would you know? I mean, how would you know this is invalid if you don't use your senses? The question is, is that enough? Sure. The question is that, and this is broader than simply the senses. There are hundreds of arguments, Steve says, against the senses, some of which stump him. Uh, and he can't untangle the exact fallacy. Is it enough simply to say, I know this must be wrong because he's relying on his senses too, so he's using what he's trying to uh, deny. and. Uh, go from there. Is that enough? Certainly that's enough. Uh, you know sight unseen that any tricky argument against the senses is invalid, or against reason, or against identity, or against reality, or against volition. You know that because all these things are the prerequ prerequisite of argumentation. Now, it's not enough if you are a philosopher. Uh, then you have to you know, be able to untangle at least within limits. You know, at a certain point, you can say, this is all garbage, and it's, life is too short even to read it. But you know, of the, let us say the first 100 arguments you should be able <laughs> to untangle. But that, there's no obligation on you to do that. And they, they invent them as fast as you can make them up. Uh, there's one that, I, for instance, I've never covered in a class. You know the time gap argument? It proves that the senses are invalid. How many of you know that one? Oh, well, that's one of the, I just never mentioned it, but it's one of the hundreds that Steve is referring to. Uh, the senses can't be valid because it takes time 
for the medium to reach us from the object. Like light waves take a certain amount of time to reach me from Steve. In that ensuing time, it's theoretically possible for Steve to have been obliterated. <laughs> and yet I'm still seeing him. So there's a gap in time between the object and the experience. And therefore, you couldn't be experiencing the object if it's theoretically possible for him to be gone. Therefore, what are you experiencing? Who knows, but it's not real. <laughs> now, you see, you could go on for that forever. Now, could you untangle that one? Yeah. Right. <laughs> he says, who cares? But the answer is they are attacking human identity. They are saying, since it takes time for the information to reach us, therefore, the information is invalid. That's all they're saying. Certainly, it's possible for you to be annihilated. In fact, a more realistic example is we are sometimes perceived stars that aren't there. Because it takes so many light years for the stars to reach us that the star may have actually disintegrated and the, the uh, light waves are finally only reaching us now. Does that prove the senses are invalid? Certainly not. We are perceiving something. That is, the light waves are not a myth. And when we say it's a star, we simply have to then discover that when the distance is gigantic, we must add in the temporal context, that the, it took a certain amount of time for the message to travel to us. How did the people discover that, that it took time? They had to use the senses. So uh, you'll find that they're all just different ways of attacking identity. And all you have to do is, is reaffirm A as A, in effect. But if you don't want to, there's no obligation on you to do it. Um, all right, we're going now to the sense, sensory qualities as real. And the importance of this is not, is not that we want to insist that uh, redness is in the table. What we want to insist is that what we perceive is real. There is no distinction between the qualities that are real, what the British empiricists has called the primary qualities, and the qualities which are just human, the uh, secondary qualities. Very few things in the theory of sense perception angered Ayn Rand as much as the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. That's why she went to the idea of puffs to begin with, deliberately to make even the spatial properties a function of our form of perception. She said, give me the worst case. Even, even you know, size and shape are a function of our form of perception. It's still real. It's still out there and still part of reality. So um, uh, we absolutely dis do not distinguish the real qualities from just the human qualities. All sensory qualities are real within the context that I've explained. Now, who else? Yes? I couldn't hypothesize. I could not hypothesize. By the way, in the later version of this, which you don't have, this paragraph has been relegated to the status of a footnote. It's already a parenthesis. And you know, there's a degradation that goes in editing. You have a paragraph, then it reduces to a sentence, then it reduces to a word, then you put it in parentheses, then you make it a footnote, and then you cut it. <laughs> so a lot of material goes that route. Now, this one has already become a footnote. Whether it'll survive, I don't know. But um, there is no way for a philosopher or anybody to know the ultimate attributes of matter. They may be what we already know, or they may not. We have no way of knowing that. That's a specialized scientific inquiry. And uh, uh, there's no way to know what is irreducible until you know the end. Because as long as there's something you still don't know, maybe everything is reducible to that. So um, we can't, this whole thing from British empiricism of, well, I can imagine a thing that has no color, but I can't imagine it that has no shape, is completely invalid as an approach, completely uh, uh, invalid. Our ability to, quote, imagine proves nothing. And if you try to use that as a criterion, what is the mistake you're making? If you say, I can imagine x, I can flip around something in my consciousness, therefore it's so in reality or it's not, what is the error of that? Primacy of consciousness. You seem to know everything. Or it's just that I see your hand right out of my eye, but that's true. That would be the primacy of consciousness. Yes? 
Is that Jack? When I was reading that sentence, I remembered that I had circled something back on page 19 when you said about... Uh, Oh, that's a good connection. You want to go back to page 19, yeah? Well, you had said that the universe is an irreducible primary, and I know you're using those in two different senses, and I want to give you my Yeah, own. the universe <clears throat> meaning the totality can't be reduced to anything else. All your, you don't have to know any more than that it's a totality to know that it can't be reduced to anything else, because there is nothing else. But if you take any particular feature within that totality, such as, for instance, shape, color, etc. then the question is, is, is all there is to say about that it is, or can you relate it and explain it by reference to something more basic? See what I'm saying? It's a, it's a distinction. You, don't have, you can say many things are irreducible. All the axioms of philosophy are irreducible. But we're talking within the context of physics. You can't say any of their laws or observations are irreducible until you would know, well, what is the totality in that field? But see, philosophy is the great advantage. We already know the totality of our field, because our field does not require us to know the detail. All we have to know is everything in general, not anything in particular. And that we're given at the outset, you see. Yes, Ray? On page 67. 67. And coming in from the bottom of 66, you say, Basically, that sensory qualities are the object as perceived. Right. Objectivity is volitional adherence. Yeah. This is automatic adherence. Right. Why not redefine objectivity as adherence both ways? I, I see what you're saying. And it would not be of any use, and you still need another concept. But let me make uh, uh, clarify Ray's point. There is a parallel between perception and conception. In both cases, there is, using Plato's word, a marriage between our cognitive faculty and the object. In perception, there's a relationship between our sensory uh, uh, organ and the thing we're perceiving. The red, in that sense, is, if we assume that that's a, a, our form of perception, is not, quote, in the object or in the mind. It's the object as grasped by the senses. Now Ray is pointing out there is a definite parallel to that in concept formation. We say uh, the object of a concept is, is the concrete out there, reality, but it's not, concepts are not intrinsic in reality, it's reality as grasped by the human mind. So he's saying in both perception and conception, there is a union of the object and consciousness. Why don't we apply the term objective, therefore, to both? since they have this similarity? Well, the answer, the short answer to that is I once did that for that very reason. And it turned out to be extremely confusing because objective, if it's to mean something, has to be contrasted to something. Now, when you apply it to a volitional process, the objectivity becomes a norm. This is what you should follow. This is the relationship you should take as against. For instance, turning away from the object and just following your own fantasy, subjectivism, or pretending that you get a message from on high, intrinsicism. There it's clear, within the realm of volition, it defines a norm and there's an alternative. In the realm of the sen senses, it is automatic. There is no option. And to have a, a term which is so inherently and so crucially functioning as a norm, apply automatically and in a way there's no alternative would be to vitiate what is crucial about the term as a guide to thought? And you would then have to say, well, OK, there is a similarity in a very abstract sense, but there's a profound difference. You don't have to worry about the senses, but it's very crucial that you use your volition to keep this relationship on the conceptual level where everybody goes wrong. So let's give a special name to it. Let's call it uh, twinkiness, because you have to be twinky all the time. That's up to you. You see, you'd end up. The word objective, if you use it for both, would end up being of interest only in a few technical treatises. And for practical, real life guidance, you would, you would drop the concept objectivity and use the one that guides thought. That's the short answer. But uh, volition makes all the difference in the world, in other words, you see. Uh, although I don't deny there is a parallel, and that parallel is important because 
It comes back to consciousness has identity. Therefore, on any level, perceptual, conceptual, you name it, cognition has to involve perceiving the reality somehow. And therefore, it does involve a, a contribution by reality and by consciousness. And that's true on any level. So it's just that the word objective is, is not helpful to apply to any form other than the volition. But that is a really good question, Ray, which took me about, I would say, 10 years to straighten out that, having given a whole course of lectures on it, and then found out I was wrong. Um, how's our uh, time going? We've got about 35 minutes left. Yeah, but we have uh, a couple sections left. Oh, I wanted to, just before we leave this, I wanted to call your attention to what I think is a good um, formulation on the bottom of 69. I like it. You have to forgive me. It's not exactly objective to pay myself compliments up here. But I don't know how else to point out a formulation that I think captures something. The very last sentence there of 69, it's in the context of people who complain that we can only perceive reality through our senses. We can't get it pure the way it is stripped of our sensory contribution. And of course, the answer is we can get it pure but not by perception. The only way to get it, quote, pure, that is the only way to take a, set aside our sensory form is to do what? To abstract, engage in science, theorize, hypothesize what the object would have to be in order to account for the kind of sensations we have, which is what scientists have, in fact, done up to a point. In other words, we have to use the conceptual faculty in order to reach this knowledge that the opponent of the senses is demanding we get from sensory data. And I think this last sentence is a very good statement of what is so perverse about his demand. What he wants, this person who wants reality pure, in quotes, is a sensory image bearing no marks of its sensory character. He wants a percept of that which, by its nature, is the object only of a concept. That's his contradiction. You see, for instance, suppose we could, quote, see light waves. I don't mean see in the sense of you know, experience red. But you could actually see a little undulation, you know, as the photons or you know, whatever is in today was <laughs> jiggling around on its way to our eye. Would that satisfy this guy? Would he say, oh, great, now I can see light waves. I've got reality pure. Would he be happy? No, sir. Not the ones I know. Because the first thing he would say is, well, if I see it, it's got to be red or green or something. If it's exactly like the air, I couldn't see it. So I'd have to see the light with the photons as red or green or fuchsia or whatever they happen to be. And of course, they're not really. That's just the way we perceive them. I want to get them without our form. In other words, I want to see them without seeing them. So that's what he really insists on. If you tell him what they are, that's not enough. He wants to see them. But when you see them, he doesn't want to use his eyes to do it. And so what he really wants is a sensory image, which has nothing whatever to do with the senses. You see? And if you think of it that way, you realize that the demand is an outrage. And yet, that's what people go around bemoaning that we don't have. Uh, oh, anything else before we go to the next section? Yes? Are cases of proximate stimulation cases of perception? Well, that depends. What, what do you mean by proximate stimulation? In other words, I stick we, a pin? Excuse, no, no, no. If we had some type of electronic device attached to somebody's visual yeah. cortex, yeah. And we could sort of recreate a reality for them, yeah. so to speak, through some, this type right. of device. They could actually see a world. They could see houses, colors, what have you. Well, that's exactly the time gap. That's a variant of the time gap argument. He's saying, suppose we put a um, brain, I'll, I'll elaborate. I think I know your point. Put a brain inside a beaker, and then hook wires up and stimulate it uh, in exactly the way it would be stimulated by the light waves and so on coming into the body, with the result that it has all of its experiences uh, just the way you do, 
would you say it is perceiving apples and so on and so on? What's the answer to that? It's just like the time gap. In other words, he's inventing a situation where you get the message where the object is gone. And the answer is, if such a thing were possible, you and the brain, and I don't know that it is, you and the brain would be perceiving, and you would know it exactly as you knew it to present the question to me. You would know that the brain is there simply by perceiving the brain. And the brain would know all the messages that it gets, and it would then have to identify, for instance, that it can't move, it's stuck in one spot, it would have to, I mean, the thing is science fiction. I don't know how you would communicate with the brain like that, but assuming there was some way of communicating, and you're asking, what would the brain's philosophy be if it was only in contact with these hypothetical impulses put into it? If the brain could conceptualize by itself, it would have to try to grasp similarities and differences. It would be like a super uh, handicapped person. But if you could get anything through, presumably you would get through the fact that you stuck it in a beaker. Uh, and it would then say, oh, I, I get it. Can you get me a body so I can get out of here? <laughs> but the point is this. Any time you actually activate the brain, you are having what is called a sensation. It becomes a perception when you integrate sensations. If you make up a science fiction fantasy like that, it is still what we would have, only then in a case like that, you know by the nature of the setup that it, you are producing it rather than an object. And that information would have to be provided to the brain. That's all. It would be just a variant of the, uh, of the uh, time gap argument. Yes? No, condensation does not imply guidance. But remember, you said this is a very important point. It's important just as an observation of the nature of consciousness, but not as a volitional suggestion or recommendation as to what to do. In other words, she doesn't say, Ayn Rand, um, you should take complex data and reduce it to the smallest number of uh, instances in, on the sensory level. That's done for you automatically. I just thought it was of interest because the same broad principle obtains of a tremendous amount of data held in consciousness in a small number of units. That's done for us physiologically. Is that what you uh, you'd have to ask a scientist about that. No, I mean, is that what you call perception rather than sensation? Well, no, sensation itself, the very sensation of red, condenses a tremendous amount of data about subatomic particles and light waves, et cetera, and so on, let alone percent. But that's done through the physiological. You'd have to know physics and physiology for that. That's, that's beyond me. Philosophy really starts only on the conceptual level. All right, I think we better move to consciousness as possessing identity. If there's any questions um, specifically on that. And that's really the crucial principle, yes, way back in the balcony. I was going to ask a question about British comparison. Oh, you were the one. OK, good. Yeah. And I think that I was able to draw an answer out of it. I hope so, because I answered it explicitly. Yeah. Well, I had a specific wrong premise that I think I discovered, and I want to see what you have to say about it. OK, go ahead. I was looking at the part of page 74. That's the page, right. And you pointed out to me where it says 74, right. And perceive reality directly, right. without some kind of effect separate from it. Right. And then it says it perceives reality by means of its effect on its orbit right. perception. Well, I thought that that meant that you perceive the objects in reality by perceiving their actions on you. But the answer I, I got. No, is no, that sir, that's not true. The yeah. What? But you perceive the objects. Correct. So that was my error. Somehow, I guess it was in a university yeah, well, what they do, you see, you're absolutely correct, and you got the right answer. But this gentleman asked yesterday, how do you answer the people who say you don't perceive reality, you only perceive its effects on your mind? Because you can't perceive it until it gets to your mind. And what they do in epistemology class, they put a big black, have a big blackboard, and there's a big like rectangle for reality. And then there's a circle for your mind. And then there's a line going from reality to your mind. 
And that is the light waves or the medium that's going from one to the other that enters your sensory apparatus and so on. And then finally, there's an experience in consciousness. And they say, now, there are you in there in consciousness. What is it you're actually, quote, directly aware of? Well, you're not directly aware of that rectangle way out there. You're not even directly aware of this medium in here. You're not directly, quotes, aware of your sensory organs. What are you directly aware of? Only the very last blip, the experience that finally reaches consciousness. And then, of course, so they just rub everything else off, and there's only the circle left, <laughs> see, which is still there. So consciousness is studying its own content. And then the question is, how do you know there is a reality? Maybe there's just consciousness studying its content, and that's the end. Now, there, the, there's a tremendous equivocation in that, which is covered on 74. We do not, quote, perceive only the effects of reality. We perceive reality by its effects. Now, then a professor will quickly say, but then you don't perceive reality directly. You only perceive it indirectly. And the answer to that is, what do you mean by direct? And you will see that his answer has got to come out as, no how. Because if you perceive it somehow, you perceive it through its interaction with you, that means you perceive it through its effects. That's not direct. But what would be direct? Perception by no means, with no organs, in no form, without identity. Ah, that's what he wants. That's the ideal that's defining direct perception for him. That means rebellion against identity. And there's, that's a classic uh, example of it. Uh, there's another form of the, every time you talk about cognition, you have to reiterate consciousness has identity. You cannot use any word like direct without remembering that has to be defined in terms of identity. Nothing is more direct than my looking at this cup. That's what, if you ask me, what do you mean by direct? I'd say, well, I don't perceive atoms directly. I infer them, but I, wh what do I contrast that to? Well, I perceive this cup directly. That's how we form the concept. That's what the word direct means. Now, if somebody says, ah, yes, but on a higher sense, nothing is direct, because even the cup, you don't really perceive only its effects, then he is obliterating the term direct. And of course, he's obliterating perception as such. So you're right. That is an important paragraph to answer. All oh, this whole page 74 is polemics against Kant and Locke and Barclay and so on. Um, anything else on this sequence? Consciousness as possessing identity. Yes? Uh, our method of conceptual functioning is equally part of the identity of our consciousness. And could a case be made that this section should come at the end of the, of, uh, the discussion? Of the you mean, that's a good question. I don't think so. Uh, <clears throat> the question is raised. Uh, you're referring to my opening remarks, I think, that in discussing consciousness identity, you must have some empirical inductive data if, to stop it from being a floating abstraction. Since the conceptual form is also part of the uh, identity, shouldn't you save consciousness has identity for the end? I think you could, theoretically, but I don't think it's necessary. You don't have to know every variant of its identity to give content to it. And once you know the perceptual, sensory perceptual data, that's enough to give content to the idea you perceive you're aware of somehow. And then the other, the conceptual, just fills into it. You could if you want. And in fact, in some treatments, Ayn Rand does put consciousness as an identity at the very end. I think in the introduction to objective epistemology, she does. But the reason I put it here is I'm torn by two considerations. On the one hand, I don't want it to be a floating abstraction. And I don't want to imply you know, that it's a proof of the sense as being valid. So I don't want to put it at the very beginning. But on the other hand, it is an axiom of epistemology. And it's going to govern the whole treatment of epistemology. Therefore, I can't save it for the end of the book, because I want to continuously rely on it and reduce our knowledge back to it. So I think the ideal position is where I found I tuck it in between perception and what comes after it. You see. That's the best way I can reconcile both. That's a good question. Um, anything else on this sequence? There is a hand that's up in the balcony. You have to move it if you're far back. Yes, OK. Isn't there a difference between the argument that the 
senses are invalid and the argument that the senses are unreliable. <coughs> What's the difference? Uh, I thought I'd heard some people say that if it's unreliable that we can perceive reality only sometimes, but there's still like elements of doubt in there. Well, you, you make intelligible, make intelligible to me the idea that the senses are sometimes valid and sometimes not. Why would you think that? When are they and when aren't they? How would you form that idea? What would be the distinction? You mean like on Mondays they are and Tuesdays they're not? Or in Philadelphia they are and in California they're not? Or in color they are and in sound they're not? Where would be the dividing line? I think they were talking about that there are some times that we can be mistaken about what we Well, give me an example. Uh, like you say he said there could be mistakes sometimes. Give me an example. Like in a testimony, and somebody thinks that they saw somebody commit a crime or something, but okay. they weren't sure. Or they misremember. Right. OK. But, but that would be Does that, that, well, that someone that. can misremember. That's certainly true. Is that an indictment of the senses? It certainly is true that a person can misremember. You can make a mistake in your memory. I've had that experience. I told my wife, I, I know I gave you the keys. I remember giving them to you. I see very clearly in my mind's eye, she said, you never gave them to me. Now, is that my senses at fault? And then, of course, she produces, uh, you know, the keys are still in my pocket. Uh, is, is that the fault of the senses? No, it's not. Remembering your past data uh, is a function of many factors. It's not only what the nature of the data were. It's also your attentiveness. Have you brought the whole context back? How alert are you, et cetera? And the way you identify errors is just the way you found out that it was a mistake by integrating non-contradictorily all the evidence. If you take any of these cases of the sense as being, quote, sometimes unreliable, you will find that in every such alleged case, the mistake that they are supposed to have made comes not from the senses, but from some kind of cognitive process beyond perception. Like you have recalled it wrong, you have identified it wrong, you have conceptualized it wrong, etc. But if you take away all these other and restrict yourself to just the automatically given, which is what sense perception is, there is no such thing as some which are reliable and some which are not. That, now, this was Aristotle's point, not uh, distinctive to objectivism. But I, I cover that briefly in connection with sensory illusions. Uh, uh, when I mentioned the bent stick and water. But that covers all those cases. Everything blamed on the senses is not the fault of the senses. You know, your uh, professor will give you two uh, lines. One will have arrows inverted, and the other will be paired with arrows going the other direction, like arrows like this or arrows like that. And one will look longer and say, you see, that shows that the senses are invalid, even though the lines are exactly the same. And it's because you see the gestalt, you see the total, and your mind tends to think that one is longer than the other. But that, again, is just like the stick bent in water. You simply have to identify the causes. Your senses are unimpeachable and not make the mistake. You come to grasp it. And as soon as you see those thereafter, you know, at the same way that the professor found out to begin with. All right, now let's see if there's anything on the perceptual level as the given. This is barely within the field of philosophy. It's put in primarily just to establish one crucial point, and that is that entities are directly given, not sensations. Sensations are an inference from uh, what we do perceive. And therefore, we do not try to prove entities, nor do we try to prove anything dependent on entities, like causality. Entities and causality, and of course, that's the heart of Hume's attack and Kant's alleged answer are given perception. And therefore, there's no question of how do you find them. You just open your eyes. Uh, and that's really the crucial point here. The perceptual stage comes first and can't be challenged. Now, Jerry, yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought you, I'm sorry. Yeah. You look like it. Yeah. On page 77, the second paragraph, uh, you uh, make the statement that a complex past mental content of yours is implicit and operative in your present right. visual awareness. Could you contrast the view you're expressing here with the modern claim that perception is theory based? Oh, God, yes. Um, take the sentence on the middle of 77. 
I say a complex past mental content <coughs> of yours <coughs> is implicit and operative in your present visual awareness. Could I contrast that with the modern view that perception is theoryly? I certainly can, but I must point out to you that it is true that perception is theory laden if we're talking about the percepts of an adult who has already conceptualized the world. In other words, when I look out now, I see that entity and automatically, outside the power of my choice, I see it as a table. That is, I see it. And I immediately relate it in my mind to that, 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 as against this, this, and this. That's automatic. I can't escape viewing it as a table. Now, in fact, uh, uh, that is a result of, first I had to go to the perceptual level and perceive the object. Then I had to conceptualize it. Then I had to conceptualize it so often to get it to such a degree of automatization that I can no longer escape it. So in that sense, if your percepts were, as an adult now, were not theory laid, you couldn't talk. And you would be, you would confront every object with the same hesitation that a doctor confronts a rare disease. Uh, you would see it, you would perceive it, and you would, couldn't go anywhere. You would be like a, like a child who perceived but hadn't yet formed a vocabulary. The essence of con the conceptual uh, function is you have to automatize it to be able to use it. Now, what these modern theorists that you're talking about are doing is package dealing an adult with a child. And their argument is, since percepts are theory laden or impregnated with conceptual knowledge now as adults, therefore, we can never perceive the world apart from our concepts. Therefore, from the very beginning, inherent in a percept is it's our thinking. And therefore, we can never get reality apart from our interpretation. Therefore, reality is unknowable. Now, that is Kantianism. It's Kant says concepts operate in the act of perceiving. See, for Kant, concepts govern percepts. Certain innate concepts actually determine what you perceive. Therefore, from his point of view, there is no such thing as a perceptual level. As soon as you open your eyes, it's already a conceptualized world. And your mind does that automatically. Well, then you could never know reality, because you only know it as your mind conceptualizes it. But the whole point is this. Conceptualization is a volitional function, not an automatic function. It's a volitional function that we build on pure percepts, and one of the rules of using concepts correctly is that we must reduce them back to the pure percepts. That's the principle of reduction. If you follow that, you don't have any problem with percepts being theory laden, because your theory itself goes back to being percepts. And therefore, all of your knowledge is directly perceptual, is that's what it comes down to. When you reach the top of your complex knowledge, to make it really knowledge, you have to take it step by step by step until finally you just point and say, it, that, it is, existence, period. And in that sense, knowledge is purely perception. You see the different senses in which you can use it. But that's a tremendously dangerous package deal that they put over on people to instill Kant under the guise of common sense, you know, which is a, a huge mistake. I'm very glad you pointed that out. Did, did that clarify to you? Yes. Uh, yeah. Which page are we? Yes. Describe how relations are integrated into perceptions, and the process that you described sounded similar to me to concept formation. In that, you say that sensations from similar objects in the past are retained and integrated by the brain. Well, you're asking me, uh, is the uh, <clears throat> process of s integrating sensations into percepts similar to the process of integrating percepts into concepts? And I would say, in a very generalized sense, it is. And I even say that in the chapter. 
But it's only in a broad sense. And the reason it's similar is because there's only so much that consciousness can do. So therefore, on whatever level it is, it has to repeat the same processes. Now, basically, consciousness can only do one thing, uh, two things, right? In order to be aware, which is the one thing it does do. But in order to get that, it has to do two things. It can do two things. Take apart and put together. Analysis and synthesis. Differentiation and integration. That's really all that it is able to do. Same and different. However you put it, as to grasp what's the same and grasp what's different. There are many different contexts and usages. But that is essentially all a repertoire that consciousness has. So of course, to get from sensation to perception, you have to discriminate the sensations from the other things uh, that they're embedded in. And then you have to, you know, not you, but your brain puts them together, integrates. And in a broad sense, that's what you do when you go from a bunch of percepts and then you put them together in contrast to chairs and tables and form the concept of chair. In a broad sense, therefore, it's similar. But there is all kinds of crucial differences as soon as you try to specify particularly what you're doing. There's no issue of measurement omission. There's no issue of abstraction on the perceptual level. There's no issue of choice. There's no issue of error. There's no hierarchy of condensation. You don't put tables into the percept of another super table, which holds tables and so on and so on. It's all cut and dried, automatic, simple, given. Whereas when you get to concept formation, you have a whole can of worms and a whole series of complexities, possibilities of error, level upon level of level, and all kinds of epistemological obligations that have no counterpart. So, it's helpful to point out a similarity, but <clears throat> you don't. Uh, there's two things in life: what's the same and what's different. And don't uh, ignore the crucial differences between the perceptual and the conceptual when you see similarities. <clears throat> yes. Eighty. We're really getting along now. We're on the last page for today. Yeah. Uh, graph entities is an epistemological primary. Earlier you said that uh, entity was a non-basic axiom. Right. Uh, but we only perceive entities in space and time. Are space and time a epistemological primary? Are they non-basic no, axioms? No. <clears throat> space and time is already a highly specialized field. Uh, that's a scientific issue. As far as philosophy is concerned, I would say this much. <clears throat> Certainly, space and time are relational. They're not you know, intrinsic like uh, the Newtonian view. But as far as the conceptual formation comes, those are much later. You can never say that those are axiomatic. Those are tremendously abstract concepts, which depend upon your ability to focus on very difficult relationships that uh, take years uh, of development. To grasp space as such, one thing being in a place and another being in a place and then abstracting from the entities. And time seems e to me even more complex. Children have difficulty telling time for years. So uh, you know, on, on an elementary level, I guess you get it in some form. But I would never say that space and time are axioms. Those are relationships. Entities far precede relationships. First comes entities. Then has to come certain types of actions that entities perform. Then has to come some type of abstraction of the qualities of entities. And I think only on a higher level, and I'm speculating, but this would seem to be reasonable, would come complex relationships among entities. Because you wouldn't yet have the type of you know, complex entities that you could relate until you uh, first did the earlier thing. So I would not make space and time axioms or primaries. Yes? I mean, I see, I perceive directly uh, an element of linear extension. Uh, I think you're trying to take me now into the detail of sense perception, which I don't think belongs to philosophy. All that philosophy can tell you is you perceive me when you look at me, and you're perceiving me correctly, somehow. Now, what exact information you are given whether you perceive the distance, or that has to be something you learn when you discover perspective 
is a scientific question. You know, there used to be thought that we perceive only in two dimensions and we have to learn perspective. And then there are other theories that we directly perceive objects at a distance. How you come to learn that is not something that a philosopher could take a view on, because you're talking about the detail of learning that you would have to then study the process. What are we actually given? What is the message impinging upon our sense data? Is there any automatic learning between the first and the later? That is not something I can dogmatize about, nor would it make a philosophic difference. If you think that if we perceive distance directly, that makes it real. Whereas if we start off all perceiving in two dimensions and we have to learn the third dimension, the brain has to learn it, that makes distance unreal, you're wrong. And that would be a philosophic significance. But the answer to that is it doesn't make any difference whether you're given distance on day one or day 50, by direct or by a complex summation of processes. If you are given it, it's there. If you're given it, that is, if it's an automatic datum, however it came to you, it's real. So you don't have to sit and worry, is space real? Not that it's space is anything, but I know who you're trying to get back at. You don't have to worry to preserve the reality of three dimensions by making it something that's given the day you open your eyes. I don't care if we don't, if we didn't perceive spatiality for the first 19 years, and then you know, when you graduated from high school, they gave you space. As long as it comes automatically from reality and your brain, it's real. There's nothing, there's no way to evaluate or challenge anything that's given you because that is the foundation on which everything else is built. So I think we can short circuit. Uh, your motivation, you see, is, is suspect there because you're trying to defend something that doesn't need defense. When, as, as to the details, that's not really within philosophy. Did you want to follow that? Is that okay? Um, All right. Uh, I think for a minute, Gary. Yeah. I'm a little confused about the the perception level. Would there be any other reason for including it? Is there a reason? What is the the positive reason for including the perceptual level as the given? I think there's one positive reason, and that is over and above all the disasters of what has been done. The positive reason is this. <clears throat> we are trying, in the broadest sense as epistemologists, we are trying to reconstruct human knowledge. That's what we would be doing even on a desert island. That is, we're trying to say to ourselves, when we reduce all the conclusions and ideas we have, what is their logical structure and what do they rest on? And that's the, the purpose of philosophy, really, to ground our knowledge, to show us what it all rests on. Right. If we are going to answer that question, we have to know what would we take as a starting point. There's no way to reconstruct knowledge and reduce it all to its foundations if you don't know what the foundations are. And therefore, as it's, it's necessary, quite apart from any polemics, to say the foundation of all knowledge is x. Now, if it should turn out, as a matter of fact it, it is, that there is two earlier stages of consciousness that are both non-volitional, then if we are going to reduce all our volitional conclusions, the question we would have to know is to which stage? Where do we have to take it back to to consider it as valid? Since there are two different stages that preceded the conceptual, you see? And it's to cover that and nail that point home and say, yes, it's true, there are two stages. But philosophy has nothing to do with the sensory stage. That is simply the baby anticipation of the perceptual stage. But from then on, knowledge starts at the perceptual, and that's where we're reducing everything to and forget the sensory. It's to make that point, you see, that once you can get it to point to an object, you do not have to then become a British empiricist and start anatomizing all the sensations. The brain does that for you automatically. <clears throat> so I think this is clarifying positively on a desert island quite over and above the human issue. It tells you when you have achieved the mission of reduction. And the mission is when you bring something to the perceptual level. If you didn't say this, then uh, if you didn't mention it, 
As soon as you discovered that there was a sensory level, you would be constantly wondering, well, do I have to go all the way back to my first contact with reality? And the answer is no, you don't. Because you only have to go back to the point where it's no longer automatic. You have to validate and reduce whatever you added by choice. What's given to you is your starting point. And here, reality gives you two stages. <clears throat> I think we have time for one last overall question on the census. Anywhere in the chapter. Yes? Would you say that um, perceptions are always direct? What would you call an indirect perception? I'll answer you with the question. OK. If we were to view an American flag, let's say on this side of the room, and it was in the colors of yellow and green, the stripes were, we viewed it for 15 seconds, and then we were to turn 180 degrees and look against a white surface, we would view again a red and white American flag, and there would be no, there would be no. I mean, you're you're saying wall. the after image? Yeah, the after yeah. image, and there's an element of memory or something in there, and I'm having. You, problems. you're. It's the same problem again. So it's a good that you raised it at the end, because I'm going to end on that. <sighs> the problem of after images, you must accept fact of identity. If you don't, I can't do anything for you. And identity includes, I have to make a radical statement, identity includes everything that it includes. If it takes a year for the medium to get to you, that's part of the identity, but you're still perceiving the object. If it takes 10 years for you to learn to perceive, but you, that's the time it takes, you're still perceiving the object. If after certain perceptions, a blinding image carries in space along with you wherever you turn your head, that is part of directly perceiving the object. That is the aftermath. And the perfect name for it would be the after image. That comes as a result of the nature of the object, the nature of our brains, and when you put the two together, certain color combinations and certain light backgrounds produce an after image. Now, is that a uh, problem with the senses? It's no more a problem with the senses than the fact that we perceive red to begin with, rather than some other form of perceiving. Does it confuse anybody? Only professors of psychology. <laughs> Nobody else goes around saying, God, I can't tell after images from the real thing. <laughs> By the very definition, you know, it's an image that came after the first one. Is, are you perceiving the object when you look at the after image? Obviously not. Is it part of your perception of the object? Obviously, yes. Is the terminal stage, it's the cessation of the stimulation. Therefore, it's inherent in the perception. It's part of the perception. It's not indirect perception. It's the last fragment of the direct perception, which is a process extending across time in various stages. Now, the thing is. All those questions come down to, I, do, I don't mean to ascribe this motivation to you, but to the professors who think it up. It comes down to this, which is my final word for today. I don't like reality's model of knowledge. I don't like the way the senses work. I don't like the fact that they need a medium. I don't like the fact that they give us after images. I don't like the way, I just don't like the whole setup. If I was God, I would have built a whole different way of perceiving. But you would find that any way that you built is something. And it would therefore not be the way you really want. And therefore, what it comes down to is the only way I will accept is no way. And that, of course, means back to uh, uh, the disaster. So the final word on that and all questions about the census has to be consciousness has identity. And that's back to the basic axioms. I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.